Blueprinting. I'm Melissa Joles with Impact Collision Solutions, and David Lure, owner of Elite Body Shop Solutions, is your presenter for this webinar. The presentation will take approximately 50 minutes, and we are recording it, and we'll post it on the website under training videos. We want everyone to feel free to type in any questions throughout the entire presentation. Um, I will read them to David, and he'll answer them. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end. And you can type those in the bottom right of the chat box. It's, you should see that in your screen under chat. And we'll go ahead and field those to David. And everybody on the call, we just want to say there are no, um, there's no such thing as a bad question. So don't hold back. Feel free to um, type away. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Well, thank you, Melissa. And uh, I appreciate all the RDA Impact uh, members joining us today. Appreciate you having me back. Um, blueprinting is a uh, subject that uh, I've been involved in for a long time, and it's something I'm very passionate about. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it's got kind of a bad rap because uh, it just it hasn't been being done correctly over the years. And and I hope to kind of simplify things a little bit in today's presentation. And um, and some of you that maybe aren't uh, blueprinting in your shops or would would like to. Uh, and you can take some of this information with them and uh, and, uh, and value from it. So I wasn't even going to put this slide up. What is blueprinting? I'm I'm pretty sure that most everybody on the on the webinar knows what it is. But then there then again, there's maybe one or two that, that don't know what it is. So I'm I'm just going to take a second to tell you. Um, it, it's also been called called damage analysis, uh, repair planning. There was a paint company that coined the phrase x-ray repair planning, and, and uh, there's a big MSO that calls it pre-op. But it's basically just the process of meticulously disassembling a vehicle and then creating a, a blueprint or, or a repair plan by capturing 100% of the damage uh, one time. So it, we're doing it one time the right way. And that's, that's kind of what blueprinting is. And uh, why is it important? You know, in the collision repair business, the only time the shop makes any money is when the technician is actually working on the car. So in order for a shop to optimize profitability, you've got to have systems in place that are going to ensure that wasteful delays are eliminated. Some of the more common delays are things like techs wandering around looking for parts, fasteners, or information. I'm sure most of you out there can relate to that. Missing, damaged, or incorrect replacement parts. Just waiting for approval and, and parts on supplemental missed damage. So a great way to reduce or eliminate these delays is through the process of damage analysis or, or blueprinting. So blueprinting is one of the most important processes a shop can implement to reduce or eliminate delays. And it can have a dramatic effect on important KPIs, such as your cycle time, customer satisfaction, and, uh, and profitability. So the goal of the webinar, it's, uh, you know, blueprinting is not a new concept by any means, but many shops still fail at it, uh, it, it successfully implementing it, or, or they just have implemented, but they're not getting the results they expected. So my goal is to guide you guys through some of the reasons why shops fail at blueprinting, and then give you some proven simple techniques that are being used by shops that have successful blueprinting programs. So what it is not uh, designed to do is uh, if you're here to learn technical skills on, on how to write an estimate or, uh, or how to use your p-page logic and your estimating system, you know, I hate to tell you, but you're going to be disappointed. You know, what I'm here today to teach you is how to apply your estimating knowledge using a proven system that's going to reduce costly errors. The system will have a dramatic effect on your cycle time, your customer satisfaction, and profitability if you use the information every day with discipline. And that's important. So some of the reasons that shops commonly fail at blueprinting is the reason number one is we make it too difficult for the real world. When lean concepts, including blueprinting, were first introduced to our industry, the initiatives were often led by well-intended paint companies that had overcomplicated curriculum. 
So, you know, back 10 years or so, it, you know, lean was the new kid on the block, and it came with a lot of bells and whistles, too many bells and whistles. And when concepts such as these are taught to us by people from the manufacturing industry from a 30,000-foot level, many of the basics were overlooked or possibly misconstrued. So as the years progressed, most people stopped doing blueprinting. There was a lucky few that figured out better and simpler ways of performing it. Those that were successful found ways of using lean thinking and applying it to blueprinting in a real-world manner, a manner that would work on the shop floor and not from a philosophical 30,000-foot-high bandage. So reason two is, you know, as somebody that's been teaching blueprinting for many years, I hear excuses all the time why damage was missed during blueprinting. One that kills me is, we are only human. So tell that excuse to a, a brain surgeon or a Blue Angels pilot sometime. The point is, is that yes, we are human, so in order to be successful at blueprinting, we have to put systems in place that make mistakes visible so that we can catch them before it's too late. So this is an old trick introduced by uh, Mr. Shingo. You see his picture there. And this mistake proofing is a technique called hokayoke. So if you want to have a successful blueprinting program, mistake proof it by using some of the hokayoke techniques that I'll share with you later on in this webinar. I like the picture of the uh, shoe with a cell phone in it. That is a uh, uh, a pokayoke device. If, if you don't want to forget your cell phone, put it in your shoes. It's just a kind of a random example I found that uh, kind of amused me a little bit. So there's Mr. Shingo. So the lucky few that were able to achieve blueprinting success at some level often doomed the process from future success by not carefully documenting the blueprint system they worked so hard on into a standard operating procedure. Because of this lack of standardization, the program was susceptible to failures caused by you know, hiring new employees, simple memory lapses, or many other reasons. So if the process has simple written instruction and people are well trained, the likelihood that the vital steps needed to produce a consistently accurate blueprint is increased immensely. Reason number four. I uh, usually get a little uh, pushback on this reason, but it's, it's very true from my experience. You know, technicians are hired to repair vehicles, not write supplements. To this day, most shops continue to ask their body technicians to perform a teardown and then write a supplement. This is not blueprinting. Please keep in mind, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the only time a shop is making any money is when the technician's hands are touching the car. So if we ask them to perform supplement writing for us, we're not only inviting problems, but, you know, we're inviting problems with estimate accuracy and we're not making any money doing it. So, you know, the technicians are a very integral part in the blueprinting process. They can offer a lot of insight in, into good damage analysis. Their involvement should be limited to the collaboration during the disassembly plan and damage analysis, then disassembling the vehicle and placing the damage or the R&I parts uh, in their designated areas. And I'll kind of touch on that a little bit uh, more here in a few minutes. So common misconception. I'm going to give you a quick lesson on... Uh, theory of constraints. The reason that a lot of shops say they don't like having a dedicated blueprint department or a blueprint analyst is because it often causes bottlenecks and delays. So all the repair jobs have to go through one resource. So by definition, the blueprint guy is a bottleneck. But here's what some people don't understand. Every system is going to have a bottleneck that dictates the shops through the Ability. excuse me, and that's okay. The problem is, is that shops continue to bring all their work in on Monday, so if smarter scheduling was practiced, the bottleneck will manage to produce the needed amount of work. So this misunderstanding of production management is another 
main reason that people abandon their blueprinting attempts. You know, in the real world, even when using good scheduling habits, you know, bottlenecks do still become a problem at times. When blueprinting starts getting behind schedule, it, it becomes extremely important to still stick to the program with discipline and not abandon it. Instead, additional resources, or you might consider, you know, extended hours uh, occasionally, you know, when the need dictates. Um, so a quick lesson on theory of constraints. Um, this uh, graphic shows like a typical manufacturing or assembly line, right? So the first guy on the left, you know, he's he's capable of producing 20 widgets a day. Next guy, 16, 10, 14, 18, and so on. So your bottleneck here is obviously which guy? Well, it's the guy in the middle, right? Because it's the guy that can only do 10 a day, and everybody else has more capacity uh, to produce than he does. So you can see represented by a stack of paper that all the work in process is building up. So in this scenario, this. Uh, I wish I could see your hands right now, but I can't. But does anybody know in a given day what the most um, widgets this operation could produce in one day? And, and the answer is, is 10 if you're lucky, right? So that's kind of how theory of constraints work. So if you want to keep an even flow, what you have to do is schedule work in as your bottleneck guy, the guy in the middle is able to get it done. And that's kind of what uh, very basics of theory of constraints. So uh, here's our first place to put uh, some questions in. If anybody wants to uh, ask a question about why shops fail at blueprinting. Melissa, I don't um, know if I you've got anything yet. I, I don't. I don't see anything yet. But if anybody, um, you know, as, as Dave continues, you can type them in, and I'll, I'll um, interject them to you, Dave, if I get any. Yeah, and we'll, we'll stop several times throughout the presentation. It kind of breaks things up a little bit for me. I actually prefer it. So, um, okay, well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on. Um, and Mitchell's Body Shop in Jackson, Tennessee. We're going to go do some blueprint training. All right, so that's uh, that's me in Jackson, Tennessee, as you just heard, at uh, Mitchell's Body Shop. And I want to uh, thank Andy Spence, the owner, and, and Clint, the estimator out there. Uh, we, we had a wonderful uh, uh, blueprinting clinic that we did out there, and it uh, helped provide us with some of the uh, materials that we used for this presentation. And I also want to give a shout out to uh, Hub City Color Match, uh, Wesley Richardson. If you're out there, how you doing? So let's uh, let's move on. Um, so now we're gonna now that we've talked about uh, the mistakes that shops make, let's start talking about what we should be doing. And uh, I want to talk now about how to set up some of the staffing, give you some uh, some ideas about how you may staff your blueprinting program. Over the years, I've tried numerous variations and combinations of people to staff a blueprinting program. And, and all of them work better than no blueprinting program, but some combinations definitely work better than others. I think much of what influences your blueprint staff is simply the size and volume of your shop. Many of my clients run smaller shops where people have to wear many hats. You know, in a small shop, it's not uncommon for the manager, it'd also be the estimator, the parts guy, and the blueprint guy. It's pretty easy to determine how to staff a really small shop, but what about one that's a little bigger? I recently worked with a client that had two estimators, and one of them liked being in the shop, and the second one was better at dealing with customers. So we moved one of them into the shop to be the dedicated blueprint analyst, and then the other one efficiently handled the entire volume of customers as a customer service manager. You know, because now he's not running back into the shop, putting out fires all day long. He can just focus on being a good customer service manager. So you may need to experiment with different staffing combinations to make it work for your unique needs. 
So that's as far as administrative staffing. Now, now let's talk quickly about technical staffing. Because the best blueprint team I have ever put together had an older and very knowledgeable technician working alongside an apprentice disassembly technician. This was at a high volume shop, and the team worked in a dedicated blueprint workspace with a blueprint analyst that never left the station. Many advanced shops have taken advantage of the benefits that creating a team system brings. And it's still possible to use a dedicated blueprint area with individual flat rate techs that are not paid as a team, but there tends to be a little bit excess movement of tools and people. And, and for some people, that's OK. Uh, some shops use rolling computer carts, and they're finding some success uh, performing blueprinting in the technician's individual stalls. And it works, uh, but I still prefer a dedicated area. And again, there's there's many ways to create a blueprint staff. And each shop is going to be a little different than the next based on factors such as skill level, shop size, personalities, et cetera, et cetera. So just don't fall in the trap of believing that your shop may be too small to be successful with blueprinting. I've analyzed damage in space from 2,000 to over 60,000 square feet, and the practical application is still the same. You know, you're, first you're going to disassemble and analyze the damage, then you're going to move the car out of the way until enough parts arrive to continuously work on it. Notice I said continuously there. What I mean by that is I, I like to get enough of the parts on hand to get the car uh, through body and then also, again, through paint. And then, you know, and then move the car in and fix it. So the key here is to only allow vehicles in the shop's repair floor once they are ready to be worked on continuously. So if you follow this discipline, you will find shop space you uh, never knew you had. So uh, a couple of setups that are used by successful shops, uh, they'll, they'll have one or two dedicated blueprint stalls somewhere inside the shop, um, you know, and then you equip it with a a laptop or dedicated computer in that area. Um, uh, I've also over the years made the mistakes of putting a dedicated blueprint area in and then discovered that it was almost impossible for tow trucks to get in and out of there. So you, that's a, a consideration you may want to, uh, to think about. And then uh, also keep uh, your fasteners and fluids in the, in the blueprint area. This is an idea I stumbled on uh, about five or six years ago. And, and, uh, Back here, if you'll notice on the picture on the left, this was a uh, blueprint uh, area we set up in a, it was a pretty good sized shop, uh, about 300,000 a month shop. Um, and the uh, gentleman in the picture is actually rebacking a molding. So there was a station there to do all your cleaning and rebacking of moldings. Um, and you'll notice all the, the transmission fluid and other liquids. Um, uh, and then also all the clips. We have, you know, you know, uh, about 80 percent of the clips that you need, you can stock in a relatively small area. I, I found so this is uh, just one way to set it up. And then this was a uh, a mobile estimating cart over on the right, and uh, it's on wheels. Um, and this was one we actually built at the shop, and you can see it's got a phone camera markers, laptop, just about everything you need to uh, analyze damage. So I just wanted to share that with you. And um, the uh, picture on the left there, that was taken at Mitchell's, as you can probably tell from the guy's shirt. That is uh, Goliath cart. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, and it is uh, you look in the bottom of the cart, you can see where it's uh, battery operated. So that does not have to be plugged in. It'll uh, operate almost the full day just on the battery power. If you're looking for a slightly less expensive option, um, you know, this one on the right was another blueprint department that uh, I, uh, I helped put together. And we had a, an old table that we put some wheels on it. And, uh, and on the back side of this cart is some shelving areas where we keep everything you would need to clean and reback moldings. Uh, you can see some of the double back adhesive uh, hanging from the front of the cart. Um, so those are just some 
some cool ways. I, I honestly believe you could set this up, uh, you know, very inexpensively in uh, just about any shop scenario. David, um, yeah, yeah. Know, look, look, looking at your presentation here, I'm seeing that you don't have to have a fan, you know, a lot of fancy equipment. So it looks like any shop can put this together pretty easily. I, I believe so. You know, I've, you know, I've, I've worked with some clients that say, well, we just, you know, we can't afford to do that, or we don't. Uh, we don't have the space for it, and there's always a way to get it done. Sometimes you just got to get a little creative. So that's, that's a good point, Melissa. I'm glad you brought that up. So um, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but most of the, you know, if you're going to set up a dedicated blueprint area, I would uh, recommend, you know, considering uh, equipping it with these type of tools. You know, parts car, clipboard, tape measure, tram gauge, tread depth gauge, uh, small mirror. I, I uh, actually what works really good. You know, for getting in behind things and and uh, taking a good look at it is uh, like a. Um, you know, if you've got a broken mirror that comes off a car, pop the lens out of it, and uh, those make a great small mirror. Um, I've also seen. Uh, you know, some of the tool trucks come around have those little mirrors that are on a teles uh, telescopic uh, rod. Those, those work really slick. Um, flashlights, drop lights, mobile estimating cart, and that's kind of what we were looking at. It doesn't have to be a Goliath. It could be something that you make, uh, but it's pretty handy to have something on wheels. You need a creeper. You need an estimating system. And access to OEM repair data is very important. Um, colored markers, and we'll get into that a little bit. And then you're, you know, you got to make sure you've got the Stuff to stay, stay safe. Excuse me, to stay safe out there. Gloves, safety glasses. So, any questions so far, guys? Not seeing any. Not so far. Keep them coming. <laughs> You're just very clear. <laughs> okay. Um, so, vehicle check-in. Um, there's a few shops out there doing this, but not as many as I'd like to see yet. Um, you know, even though the process of performing a vehicle check-in, you know, with the customer during the vehicle drop-off may not be considered a part of the blueprint pro process directly, it's worth mentioning that the information obtained during the check-in is absolutely vital to the blueprint. For those not completely familiar with the process of checking in a vehicle or using a check-in form, I'll try to enlighten you. So with the customer present during the vehicle drop-off at the shop, this process involves walking around the vehicle and communicating and documenting some of the following things. So what damage is a result of just the accident, right? So is the is that damage uh, related or not? You want to find that out. Unrelated prior damage. If so, uh, you uh, want an estimate to fix that. It's an excellent upsell opportunity. And if you're not doing a check-in, you miss out on those things. Um, malfunction indicator lamps, such as check engine lights. You know, it's a. Uh, how, how many times have you had to call a customer to find out if the check engine light was uh, was on before? the accident or not, or, or even worse, you you know, you clear it for them at no charge. You know, it's good to find out those things uh, up front with the customer. And uh, is there anything unusual cool about the, the way the vehicle's performing mechanically? And then touch of paint and other freebie promises, those are things that we want to talk about up front. And those seem insignificant, but, you know, the, the customers are really paying uh, money to get it their car restored like it was before. It's not really very exciting. So if, if there's something like touch-up paint or something that that uh, they've asked us to do, and if we forget to do that, it's a real turnoff, and uh, it can and it can affect your CSI scores and, and your customer retention. There's no doubt about it. So include that as part of your your check-in process. Um, so I would I would uh, highly encourage you to consider adding this process at your shops and, and having this information on hand during the blueprint process is quite important. It's a great way of communicating the customer's concerns indirectly through the use of a form to the blueprint analyst, and uh, this will ensure that things don't get missed. So um, 
Melissa, I, I think, did I send yeah. you a copy of this check-in form? So I will anybody send, that, yeah, anybody on the call today or on this webinar, I will make sure you get a copy of this form. I'll send it after the webinar today. Yeah, this is a, a form that's been in use by uh, quite a few shops. Um, I, I, I designed it about six or seven years ago, and it's, it's been thoroughly field tested. And uh, if you like it, uh, please feel free to use it. It's my gift. So step number two, identify mechanical issues. So identifying mechanical issues prior to disassembling and thereby disabling a damaged vehicle is always preferable. It's not always possible, but it is always preferable. I'm sure everyone can relate to the delays that are caused when these problems are discovered on the day the car was supposedly going to be ready for the customer. So in a collision, mechanical issues uh, can involve many things. However, the most common are suspension, air conditioning, uh, damage to the cooling system, wiring, supplemental restraint systems. Um, and I recommend that you first you address these items by reviewing the customer information sheet or the uh, excuse me the check-in sheet. Uh, if possible, take it for a test drive. Um, have any of you ever sent a car out uh, before you even started the collision repairs for an alignment? It works very well. It, it's not always possible if you've got suspension damage uh, that warrants some replacement items, but uh, if you can, send that thing out and get the alignment done up front. It saves a lot of hassles later on. Um, using a scan tool to help diagnose trouble codes, and uh, always ask the customer how many passengers were in the vehicle especially if there were restraint systems uh, that were deployed. So check those seat belts. And check the interior electronics, your heat, your air, radio, and uh, also your fluid levels. So step number three. This seems like a, a no-brainer here, but you wouldn't believe how many shops don't do it. So how many times have you guys on the webinar seen a technician take the front bumper off of a car that was in the shop to get the rear bumper fixed. I'm going to see a show of hands. Probably too many times, huh? So this isn't really a complicated step, but it's one that's often skipped with costly results. Shops need to include this step as a standard operating procedure and also hold people accountable because the technician must be properly informed prior to touching even a single wrench to the vehicle. Make it part of your program to have the estimator go over the check-in sheet with the technician and also review the estimate if one had been previously prepared. So use the next step, which we're going to get into it called visual mapping, to help with this communication. It, it'll clearly indicate what parts need to be removed in order to properly analyze the damage. So a great form of communication between the blueprint analyst and the disassembly tech is the use of a uh, colored water marker to write on the vehicle. In a real-world body shop, it can sometimes be difficult to pull the technician aside for period, you know, extended periods of time to discuss all the, the details of disassembly. So using this technique by writing the instructors, uh, instructions on the car in advance, uh, you know, it'll It'll really help you out. So this technique can also be used by the customer service rep that is identifying the damage during uh, the check-in process. And it's especially handy when there are multiple dents or scratches on a single panel, you know, some of which are supposed to be repaired and some of them that are not. So don't leave it up to your technician to, to get to choose which dings on a panel he gets to fix. Let's really spell it out for him. So, when you're doing visual mapping, you can use any color you wish. Uh, I, I prefer to use uh, the colors of a traffic light, red, yellow, and green. So uh, you can use any color you want, but uh, you know, red is, is pretty clear. If it's uh, circled in red, that means don't fix. Yellow means caution. We don't know if we're fixing it yet. We may have to go get some more information before we we determine if it's uh, something we're going to repair. And in green means go ahead and fix it. It's part of the accident. 
So you know you can come up with your own system of words, abbreviations, or symbols to mark the vehicle with. But a couple of most common ones I like to use are like the X for remove and replace, uh, and R for uh, repair, R and I for uh, you know for R and I obviously for remove and install. And so you'll see uh, the picture on the right where there's a, a red circle, and then it's got another green one around it. So it uh, initially that uh, being was discovered as prior damage, um, but we uh, you know we were able to upsell the customer, and they wanted to have it fixed too. So we then circled it in green. Now it tells the technician that it's okay to go ahead and uh, and proceed with that. So here's a uh, little video uh, at Mitchell's where we are we're kind of going through the process together. And um, you see there we've got our uh, traffic light colored markers. And uh, here I'm working with the technicians and the uh, blueprint guy on which uh, parts we want to have this assembly tech take off the vehicle. And the, that grill obviously is pretty wasted, and we're going to replace that. Going to replace that. Apparently, we're going to replace that and that too. Then moving on to the fender, uh, we've got a, a few trim pieces that we're going to need to uh, remove and install. It was a shop decision that they could reuse that emblem. Again, again, that's up to you. It's not my job to decide. Some some guys prefer to replace those emblems. But by clearly marking all this, it, you know, as the technician works through his disassembly process, he'll know exactly what needs to come off. There's that dent again that we were able to upsell. Notice the uh, the uh, green surrounding the red and then the damage to the front of the door which was part of the accident. All right, questions so far on the techniques? Oh, we have a question. Let me see here. Excellent. Thank you. Says, I hope I know the answer. Um, <laughs> you do. Um, uh, we want to mention that the photos um, have to be taken before mapping for some of the like State Farm DRPs. Absolutely, absolutely. We've uh, um, in uh, here shortly. I'll kind of uh, touch on on photos a little bit, but that's extremely important that uh, you know you have four corner photos taken, um, you know, prior to moving the vehicle in. Uh, for disassembly, and especially with State Farm, uh, <laughs> they wouldn't uh, take too kindly to forgetting that step. So I'm glad you brought that up. Looks like that's the only comment. Uh, I don't see any questions. You're just doing an excellent, clear presentation. So everybody Bye. is on board and following you. I love it. Okay, let's move on to step five, uh, meticulous disassembly, pretty fancy word. And we want to do this in sequence. So in this step, it's time to start disassembling the damaged vehicle. And uh, if you're lucky enough to have a dedicated blueprint analyst that will be keying in the estimate as the technician removes the part, it will be much easier to remove the parts in approximately the same group sequence as your estimating system parts group. For example, in your estimating parts group, you've got your bumper, your grill, and your lamps. Um, of course, this method's not always possible depending on the vehicle and uh, the damage. Uh, but when it is possible, you'll find that removing the damaged parts and entering the damage into the estimating system with both people following the same group sequence uh, definitely make your life easier. And I'll explain a little bit more of that in an upcoming step probably heard the term meticulous disassembly or 100% teardown. This refers to the practice of taking off every damaged component that is bolted or otherwise fastened to the vehicle. This practice should not only include damaged parts, but also parts that are being removed from blend panels or that need to be removed for access. Damaged assemblies such as bumpers should not only be removed as an assembly, 
but should also have all the, the grills, lamps, moldings, fasteners, all that other stuff removed as well. There's three main reasons that 100% tear down is, is recommended. You know, first we want to we want to reveal all the hidden damage. Uh, we we've got to get it on the repair plan. We want to also ensure that the fasteners that we're removing are, are going to be able to be reused. Um, sometimes they'll break. Um, and third reason is, you know, we want to facilitate ease and mirror matching later on. So when the when the parts come in, it's a lot easier to uh, to mirror match against a part that is uh, not bolted underneath a bumper somewhere that's hidden. So. That's one of the, the reasons we like to do that. And then, uh, of course, you want to take photos prior to disassembly on, on complicated assembly. So, you know, it's, it's one of the things I get a little bit of pushback on is, you know, this bumper is really going to be hard to put back together if I take it 100% apart. And, you know, through experience, I found that, you know, these guys are more capable than they, than they think they are in, in some cases. Um, and if you take some some good photos prior to the disassembly, it, it does help them put it back together. So step number six is the technician is disassembling the vehicle as described in the previous step. The parts being removed should be separated and placed into two visually separate spaces. Now this might be a, a new, con hopefully this is a new concept to some of you guys that have been uh, experimenting with, with blueprinting over the years. So you've got one space for damaged parts, the bad parts, as we like to call them, and another for the parts that are just being removed and later reinstalled, your good parts, R&I parts. So I prefer to use a table to lay the parts out on, but you could also use the floor or a combination of the floor plus a table. So you can see in the, the photos down below, there's a couple different uh, I think there's a couple different shops I'm using the photos from, and, and it's just a, like a six-foot table. I, I really like the six-foot tables that fold in the middle. They're easy to uh, move around and get out of the way if you're not using it. So clips and fasteners and baggies. Clips and fasteners tend to be an often overlooked part of the damage analysis process and with costly consequences. Some shops actually consider clips and fasteners an expense. So when damaged or missing fasteners are captured and built out on the initial blueprint, they then become a profit center. I've seen several cool ways to capture and record these, but my favorite technique is to use a, what I call a clip sheet. By the technician taping a sample of the damaged clip to a clip sheet and writing out the quantity needed, person that's entering the information into the estimating system will have the information he needs. And this is especially handy if uh, he doesn't have to go run the technician down to ask him if there was any damaged clips because he knows. There are two additional benefits to using this system. The first is you can take a photo of the clip sheet to send your parts vendor. If uh, you know, Sometimes they don't always send you the right clips, do they? If you send them a picture, uh, the chances are uh, are definitely increased that, that they'll send you the right part. And, and then the clips are there where you can easily mirror match them when the new clips do arrive. So if your company stocks the needed clips, uh, you know, if you've got your own clip assortment, you should put the new replacement clips in a marked Ziploc baggie or another container that you know you may use. I like Ziploc baggies. But you put them in there with the old reusable clips so that later on, when it comes time to reassemble the vehicle, everything the tech needs will be right there for them. It's a term called kitting, because you're actually building a kit with everything needed to assemble a car on the parts card. So let's, uh, that's a picture of a clip sheet um, over on the right. It really doesn't have to be anything fancy. But uh, you can see we've got a clip taped to it. So um, <laughs> this is a shop I uh, did some work with. Uh, does the uh, picture on the left look familiar to anybody? The reason body men always have a hidden drawer full of clips is because if they didn't, the cars would never go home on time. And, and that's unfortunate. Um, 
So they spend, uh, this gentleman here spent, uh, I watched him 15 minutes looking not just through his clip drawers, but through other people's clip drawers, trying to find a simple retainer to put a car back together. How nice would it have been if it was actually on his parts car all ready to go? So if you want to avoid that, do that. Rebacking moldings and trim. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the previous step, we're, we're trying to build a kit for the technician during the reassembly process. So cleaning the adhesive and applying new adhesive backing on the moldings and emblems should be done immediately after you remove them. Don't wait till the day the car is supposed to go home. There are several advantages to doing the rebacking now. You know, the first one is if, if the molding is is uh, needs to be painted, it lessens the chance of damaging the fresh paint later on. If uh, if uh, molding or an emblem is going to break, you know, let's let's break it now uh, so it can be added to the repair plan. And uh, then, of course, it's ready to go back on during uh, assembly. It's part of, of the kit. So step nine, this is sequenced analysis of damage using what I call the arrow down method. I didn't come up with that name. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, named Lee Rush actually came up with this. Uh, and I don't think he invented it either, but he's the one I stole it from. So there's several schools of thought out there about what sequence to put damage entries onto the estimate, right? So years of us. Most of us, including me, were taught to start with the point of impact and then work outwards. And now I don't agree with this method because it opens up too much room for error. About 10 years ago, uh, you know, the guy I just mentioned, Lee, he, he suggested that if I wanted to quit missing damage, that I should use the information in the estimating system and take it to the damaged car instead of the other way around. So in other words, he wanted me to start with the first group in the estimating system and use a sequenced method of asking the question, is there a damaged part or an R and I operation that needs to take place in the front bumper group? Yes or no? So if the answer is yes and you open the front bumper group and you go to the first part on the list, for example the bumper cover, then ask the the yes or no question again, and so on. So by keying down through every part in each group, you'll now catch parts that may have been completely destroyed or torn off during the accident. They were, they were missing. So in addition to this method, I also highly recommend using actual OEM diagrams. Um, you know, the, the estimating systems, I think, are getting better, but, you know, the OEM diagrams, if you've got, if you've got a, a schematic, got all the parts specifically for that vehicle and it, it is a better way to go so I, I recommend using them in conjunction with with one another for sure so by using the, this method uh, mr. Shingover said poke yoke right <laughs> that's uh, that's the process of eliminating errors so here's another example so if we've got our estimating system up here. We're going to start with the first part. We're going to say, is this part damaged? Yes or no? We're going to walk over to the, the vehicle or the part that's been taken off the vehicle, look at it. Is it damaged? Yes or no? And then we're going to go to the next item. We're going to ask, then, are the clips okay? The fasteners, the sliders, and so forth. So that's, it's kind of backwards thinking from uh, how uh, many of us have been trained but it's, it's well worth the effort. So let's talk uh, quickly about photo documentation. Um, we, we all know that, uh, like somebody asked earlier, yeah, you better take a photo first. Um, so in addition to your company's, you know, standard photo operations, you know, you want to, I like, I like spreading the parts out like in groups on the table or on the floor and getting pictures of the individual pieces. Um, if you do that, uh, your insurance guys are going to love you for it. And, um, and always take more pictures than you think you'll need. And uh, there's a couple of videos that are on YouTube that I would uh, highly recommend you guys watch, uh, 
especially if you are a state farm shop, they have a what I would consider an excellent um, an excellent YouTube video on uh, collision photography, and also uh, Collision Hub has one. So if you uh, go to YouTube and uh, and look by Collision Hub or State Farm, I'd highly recommend that you watch those. Okay, so I hate it when people say stuff like this is the most important step, but this is the most important step. I'm going to ask you to print the estimate out with a pen, check off each damage entry on your estimate as the corresponding part is loaded onto the parts cart. You guys were probably wondering when we were going to start loading the cart. Well, now's that time. So if you have everything checked off your estimate and there are still damaged parts on the on the table or on the floor, you may have missed something. It's a very simple but very powerful technique. So you'll finally, you know, be sure to place the parts in the same manner as discussed in a, the earlier step when you're loading them on the cart. You want to divide the good and the bad parts onto the cart. And this makes checking the replacement parts for correctness, you know, your mirror matching process, a ton easier to do. My philosophy that if a task is critical to your success, you must make it easy to do or, or it won't get done. So very few parts guys are willing to search to the bottom of a messy pile of parts to perform mirror matching. So if it's easy to find, it'll more likely get done. So let's see what we got here. We got a video. And uh, this is uh, during our uh, Blueprint Clinic. And now we're going through the verification process. And uh, Clint, who's doing the, uh, the blueprinting as the analyst, he's uh, working with the technician. And he's, he's basically hollering out the name of the part technicians loading it onto the cart and he's uh, checking it off so they're kind of working in tandem as a team here so it just kind of depends on how you want to do it sometimes the uh, blueprint analyst can load the cart himself and so see they're putting the uh, the uh, bad parts or the replacement parts on different shelves than the good reusable parts and so on. So that's I just kind of wanted to show you guys a kind of a visual of, uh, of that process. That's right, it's okay, okay. We are error proofing when we do that. So if you've got, again, if you've got parts left on the table and everything's checked off your estimate, what does that tell you? All right, I'm going to show you guys some real world parts carts. Um, the uh, picture on the left. This is a. This shop had a very well developed um, blueprinting process. Uh, they've got parts carts in numbered uh, squares on the on their uh, shop floor. Uh, the windshields of the cars actually had the cart location number writ written on the windshield, so that the technician could easily find them uh, when it came time to uh, reassemble the car. Uh, picture on the right is an example of uh, separating good parts uh, from bad parts. Um, I like the use of, of the tubs. That keeps the smaller parts from uh, falling on the ground, getting lost, especially when the cart gets rolled around. There's another example of that on the left. Um, I, I love the picture on the right. This is, this is the epitome of a ready-build kit right here. All the parts have been mirror matched. Um, the shop chose to put them back in the boxes, and you'll notice they've even got the uh, the coolant on the cart. So the technician, uh, when he puts his car back together, has everything he needs. He doesn't have to wander around the shop looking for stuff. That's a perfect example. Um, picture on the left. This was uh, something that, that impressed me. A lot of people don't know what to do with the trim panels because they're large. If you put them on the cart, sometimes they fall off or get damaged. Um, I like to see uh, 
systems like this use to, to kind of get them out of the way so they don't get damaged. Uh, and I also not a big proponent of leaving anything in the car that could damage the, uh, the interior. So this is a good alternative to that. I've seen some shops that will actually take uh, like a bubble wrap and uh, wrap uh, trim panels and, and other parts and so that's another way you could do it. And let's see, uh, let's talk about parts carts. Um, picture on the left, the, this is a, these are excellent parts carts. They're uh, a little bit more expensive than some of the others, but, but as you see, it may be worth the investment because they're very stackable and you can fit a lot of them in a very small area. Um, and the shelves are easily adjustable. Um, the picture on the right, that's from a shop I visited in California, very, very advanced shop. And they're using those, uh, what do you call them, uh, Melissa? The, uh, those type of carts? You said you saw them somewhere recently. Uh, you, well, you can get them at Home Depot, Costco. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, so they're, I, I've seen them in restaurants. They're basically a restaurant cart. Um, the guys at uh, Mitchell's in uh, Jackson, Tennessee, were also using these type of carts. And they had a few that they had actually welded uh, together to make a larger cart. I thought that was a very neat idea. So how about some questions on the uh, techniques? I, I do have a question. Um, somebody is asking, should you wait to get all the parts in before starting the repairs on the vehicle? Okay, good, excellent question. Um, and, and the answer is, it's, it's up to you. Um, the way I train uh, the shops that I work with is, is I like to at least have what I call all the critical parts on hand. And, and critical parts in this case is enough to get it uh, through paint. So it would be everything that that's going to require you to get that vehicle through body and then also through paint. And then when it comes back into assembly, uh, you know, you may have a, an emblem or, or something that's still on order. But I want to get it all the way through paint so that it doesn't uh, create holdups in your production system. Um, some shops that are fairly advanced uh, will demand that part of their production ready criteria, as we call it, is is to have 100% of the parts on hand. And that's not a bad technique either. Um, it's just kind of a business decision. And uh, what I would suggest is that, you know, as you know, you go down this road, the better and better you get at it, the uh, more strict you can be about your production-ready criteria. And, um, but uh, it, it, is, it is better to at least get enough parts through paint, to get it through paint. Anybody have any other questions? You can uh, type them in, and I'll read them to David if you do. Yeah, they can keep typing even if we uh, we move on. There'll be a, another yeah. question and answer session coming. I just I just wanted to show you guys some some cool things. You know, I I have a uh, I have an excellent job. Uh, you know, in, in what I do, I get to go visit a lot of shops and help them get better, and and I get to take ideas from one shop and and use it in another. It's, um, so I, I get to see a lot of cool things out there. And, and uh, tool cards, everybody knows what a tool card is, but where they really come in handy is, is when, you're, uh, when you've got a damage analysis area set up. It's the old 80-20 rule. You know, the tools that you use 80% of the time can easily fit on a, on a small tool cart. You don't need to have a big mammoth uh, toolbox uh, for your damage analysis process. So I love seeing these roll around carts. Um, I was introduced to this concept. There was a shop that was taking cardboard tubes like the ones you see on the right. You know, those uh, sometimes uh, I think GM used to send out a lot of moldings in those tubes. So they would just save those. And then they would actually attach them to their parts cart with their moldings in after they reback them and uh, keep them protected in there. Excellent idea. Um, marking wires and tubes, um, that uh, takes a few extra minutes, but boy, it saves a lot of time on the back end. Um, taking photos of, of your wiring, taking photos of, of your tubing, uh, underhood photos to uh, capture where your labels are supposed to go. So the, the reason this kind of stuff's important is, is 
uh, you know, there's a couple schools of thought out there about this, but I I like to throw my old parts away after my new parts are here because it, it saves a lot of uh, part space. And um, you know, if you've got good photos, uh, you can usually throw the old ones away. So if you've got sometimes you got to get photos to, to remember where your labels were if, if you're going to throw that old hood away, right? So just want to throw that out there. You I uh, said this earlier, you know, uh, use OEM schematics, and and by God, use OEM data, uh, repair methods, all data. Um, you know, this stuff is is more critical than ever uh, with the technology these days to uh, make sure that we're repairing these things correctly. And it also helps us throughout the blueprinting process make sure that we're analyzing the damage correctly. So I want to use that stuff. Ten step sheets. Um, you know, these are something that uh, you know, we talk about standardizing processes, making sure everybody in the building knows how this is supposed to be done. And and the only way you can really do that is by by writing it out. So there's no point in having a, you know, I, I used to write uh, SOPs for the blueprinting process, like 20, 30 pages long. Well, nobody would read the damn things. So if you've got, if you can boil it down to 10 essential steps during the disassembly process and maybe 10 more during the repair planning, uh, you've got something that people can uh, can use and they can keep this posted out in the repair area. Some people blow them up in the posters and hang them on their wall um, and then train the process and then audit it. Uh, you got to make sure that uh, you know people are going to do these things uh, continuously because if they do these 10 things on every single blueprint that they do, your success rate is going to go through the ceiling. Questions? How are we doing on time? We're right at 2:58, so we're doing we're doing great. Does anybody have any more questions for David? Um, I am going to send his information to everybody along with that form that we showed you earlier, so you'll have that. And you know, we would really like to ask. Oh, uh, we really like to ask um, of you guys if you could send us any suggestions on future webinars. Um, we will certainly try to make them available for you, but we, you know we want to hear from you. So let us know. Please email us. And um, if there's no further questions, which I don't think we have, uh, that'll conclude the webinar. And we really appreciate everybody taking time out of their busy schedules to to uh, participate today. Thank you. Arigato.